Good evening, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world and when you're watching. My name is Eric Pride. I'm uh, going to be with you for the next hour or so talking about horary astrology and in particular the evolution of this ancient art. I've been practicing astrology since 2004. Um, I've been certified in horary astrology through the Astrological Institute of Research, um, which is the program Alfie Lavoie um, has compiled and, and created. So, um, all through the through the um, through the presentation, they feel free to speak up and ask a question. You can throw it in the chat if you're in the Zoom meeting. Um, if it's on Facebook, um, I will do my very best to get back to you with an answer as soon as possible. Um, again, if you're in the Zoom, feel free to unmute yourself, stop me at any point in time. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So horary astrology, um, <clears throat> a really exciting science that is not allowing me to, there we go. <laughs> so let's talk about what horary astrology is first. So horary literally translates to the word time. And it's one of the four classical pillars of, of ancient astrology being horary, natal, um, mundane, and electional. So horary um, was the foundation of which all medieval and ancient astrologers learned astrology from um, as they studied each of the four foundations. Horary was first because it gave them an opportunity to really get an understanding of the planets, the signs, and the houses. Um, the it's also incredibly popular um, when astrology was first, you know, coming out and through most of the middle to late ages, because many individuals were unaware of their time of birth. And for even um, a larger number may not have been certain what their actual birth date was. So horary was, was developed and uncovered and discovered as a way for the general population to be able to utilize astrology without having a birth chart. Um, it is a form of divination where a question um, is answered based on the construction of a horoscope. So when I say that, when we think of a birth chart, it is a snapshot of the heavens at our moment of birth. And, you know, we, we get this beautiful analysis of who we are in the world, what our talents are, our strengths, our weaknesses, etc. With horary, we take a snapshot of the heavens at the moment a question is understood. And it is through the interpretation of these planetary positions um, that we are able to answer a lot of really amazing questions that we're going to get into. And later on, we're gonna look at some examples. And I hope you're all as excited about horary as I am. So, um, we talked about why it was the first skill that was learned by uh, medieval students during a move past um, that. So what can horary answer, you know? And an easier question I've always said is what can't horary answer, um, which is for the most part has to do generally with timing and more philosophical, um, esoteric, spiritual type questions. But the possibilities of, of horary are seemingly endless and extremely practical. You know, if you can think of a question, it can most likely be answered. And I actually have a small list here um, that I want to go over with you um, of some of the, the questions I've seen and some of the questions that, um, you know, can be answered with it. So you could ask, should I ask for a race of your employer and what is your boss going to say? Um, will this person ask me to marry them? Is my boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever uh, cheating on me, are they married? Um, which is a question that we will look at as an example. Where is my lost dog? Um, where are my keys? Where is my wallet? Um, you know, will this surgery be successful? Um, not only, you know, describing situations, but like I said, where? So Horary does an absolutely where is my amazing lost dog. Um, where are my keys? Where is my wallet? Is somebody you know, asking a question? I'm getting some feedback. I think we're okay now. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> Horary can answer where, you know, um, so it can describe um, how far a missing object is from someone, where um, it was last seen, where it lays, um, the physical distance, um, and also if it was stolen, you know, and more importantly, is it going to come back, which is one of the first questions we attempt to answer when it is a missing object or person. Eric, Eric? 
excuse me, um, can it answer when we are going to die? This is um, an interest that is a, a very esoteric question. Um, it's it's well esoteric, but I mean it's it's um, the short answer is yes. The long answer is it's probably not appropriate, and and I think that um, it's for me personally. There are certainly astrologers that do that. I think that. You know, that really needs to be left up to the universe when and how that's going to happen. But certainly death was a very important part of um, culture. And, you know, in, in medieval times, you know, King would ask, you know, if I'm, are, are these people going to, to die? When am I going to die? You know, do I need to prepare for, you know, um, somebody to take over the throne? So um, in theory, yes, it can. However, what I would say is that when we're looking at timing events, this is the only area where horary gets a little muddy. Um, it certainly can answer who, what, where, and why, when becomes a little difficult um, in terms of the, the mathematical calculations. And there's, we're still developing um, research um, on how to answer the when, we can kind of get in the ballpark with that. Now, if somebody really truly wanted to know when they were going to die, um, you know, or when I'm going to meet the love of my life, those when questions, I always default to the natal chart, the solar arc directions, et cetera, you know, when I'm doing that type of predictive work. But in, in theory, it, you know, it, it could. Um, but, you know, I'm a pretty spiritual individual, so I think sometimes maybe my my judgment gets clouded and I feel like those types of things are really between um, God and us or, um, you know, the universe or the goddess or, you know, whatever, you know, your understanding of, of divinity would be. But in theory, yes, it could um, answer that. I know personally, I would not answer that question um, if somebody wanted to, to know that. Um, you know, astrology is the language of the universe. It's been called the language of God. Um, and I think some things are better left um, unanswered. And that's probably one of them. But that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alrighty. So evolution in horary. Um, so here is the um, where things get um, a little different from classical astrologers. So a, a lot of individuals who practice horror now utilize ancient techniques, only the seven classical planets and have all these rules about what you can and cannot do. Now, when I first started studying horror, I utilized that, you know, I learned those, those methods. When I studied with Alfie Lavoy, and for those of you who don't know who he is, he has been um, seemingly around since the beginning of time and probably one of the most brilliant astrological minds on the planet. Um, and he is the horary guy to go to um, with stuff. But he also is a mathematician, a statistician, um, <clears throat> and really likes data. So he has taken his entire 50, or 60, 60 plus years of studying astrology and run statistical analysis of you know, what works, what doesn't work, has added Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, which is for the most part kind of a, a taboo among many horary astrologers. As you know, we don't, we don't use those because we don't have the medieval astrologers didn't know about them, the rules that they have, you know, they like and they, they work. But astrology, like any language, um, is constantly evolving. You know, it's, it's, we, we get better at it. You know, we, for thousands of, of, you know, we had horary and then it, we had astrology and then we had natal astrology and then astrologers learned about progressions and they discovered new planets. And, you know, I think it's important to, you know, honor, you know, where we've come from, but also be aware that as human beings, we are in this kind of evolutionary process of, of personal, spiritual and global development and enlightenment. And I think that that marries beautifully with Horary and um, <clears throat> Alfie and his investigators group really um, have put a lot of time and effort and work into figuring out what works and what doesn't, 
with the addition of some of these things. Another way that horary has evolved, and when I talk about, you know, evolutionary horary, is the removal of outdated rules. So medieval astrologers would call these strictures against judgment, okay? So there were certain things that you would see in that snapshot of the chart that would say, oh, no, um, I can't or I shouldn't answer this. If the ascendant is in an early degree, it's supposedly too early to ask the question. If it's in a late degree, it's too late to ask the question. If Saturn is in the seventh house, you know, the astrologer should not um, does not have the, you know, ability to answer that, you know, if certain, if the sun or certain planets were in the via combusta, which are those, and I think I've got, oh, here we are, yep, the via combusta, which is that 15 degrees Libra to um, 15 degrees Scorpio, they wouldn't answer questions, um, because it's, that via combusta is Latin for the fiery way, and it's just considered, <clears throat> excuse me, fall allergies here in the northern hemisphere, um, was considered uh, a taboo uh, period and time and placement in the heavens to ask questions. Now, um, one way that this, our, our art has evolved, and I'm going to take each of these and talk about why they don't necessarily, you don't necessarily need to look at a chart and be like, oh, Saturn's in the seventh house, or the ascendant is within three degrees, I can't answer this question, it's too late, it's too early. First thing we need to consider, let's talk about those degrees, those early degrees and late degrees of an ascendant. Um, <clears throat> if it's one or two, especially if it's within one or two or three degrees. Ancient astrologers were, were calculating horary charts throughout the day, throughout kind of like their practice, you know, their art. More often than not, their students were calculating the charts starting at the beginning of the day and were just kind of progressing the chart as clients would come in. Um, <clears throat> And when you have a very early degree um, or you have a very late degree, you know, and you account for the potential for human error, um, it is quite possible that that sign that is on the ascendant may not actually be that sign. If it's in really early degree, it might still be in the previous sign. Or if it's calculated a very late degree, there could have been a wobble in the calculations and it could be at a later degree, which when you don't have the sign that's on the ascendant, which is the very first place you begin in horary, um, the question will completely fall apart and you'll get the wrong answer. So it's really, now that we have technology that can calculate with precision, and if you have a 29 degree rising um, on the ascendant, certainly that will tell us a bit about the disposition of where the question is going, but it no longer needs to be I don't want to, I can't answer that question. It really was more to cover the astrologers behind to make sure they didn't get the question wrong or give bad information. Um, <clears throat> next, let's talk about the moon being void, of course. Now, these are just four of some of the most common strictures against judgment. There are literally hundreds. They were very superstitious individuals and had a lot of reasons why a chart coder could not be read. If the south node was in the first house is one that I recently just heard of that I was not aware of, so on and so forth. Now, as astrologers, we, we hear like, oh, you know, the moon is void. It's moving from one sign to another. It's not, you know, a good time for X, Y, and Z. And the moon being void, of course, does not necessarily negate the chart being able to be read, where you say, you know, I can't read this for you, I'm sorry. It provides another layer of information, especially if the moon comes into play. Um, but Alfie, through his, his research and his data and his crunching, has found that just because the moon is void, of course, does not mean that the chart uh, cannot be answered. Same thing with Saturn in the seventh house, but I will say this. When Saturn is in the seventh, seventh house represents the astrologer. Unless the astrologer is asking the question themselves, then Saturn can be in the seventh house. That's fine. But Saturn is that restrictive planet, you know, that, that kind of archetype, and it was, you know, considered one of the great malefics back then. So it was believed that the astrologer would not interpret the chart properly. And I have to say that there is something to this. Um, I don't think, I think that it's more like when a planet goes retrograde, where it's like, like Mercury, we're in the Mercury retrograde now. So we hear like, you know, double check everything, read, you know, everything twice, have somebody review your work. It's the same thing when Saturn's in the seventh house. If Saturn is in the seventh house of the chart, I will double, triple, quadruple check my work. 
I will often also usually ask a colleague to take a look at it. The second you see Saturn in the seventh, it's always best to have a second set of eyes on it to make sure you haven't missed something. But it doesn't mean the chart is unreadable. It just means that you need to be a little extra careful. And then this final one, the Via Combusta, this one I think is just, I, I saved this one for last. I probably should have put it in the fourth in the line, but my Mercury is in Aries, so my brain is sometimes all over the place. The this period, um, this, this this fall in the Northern Hemisphere, which is where most of these astrologers were practicing, was um, a period where they would go on vacation. It was a prime time for fishing. So it was very easy for them to say, I can't take any questions when the sun is in from here to here, so that they could take that time to, to get away and, and recuperate. There does not seem to be, at least in horary, any correlation of a planet being under a malefic influence when it falls in that 15 degrees Libra to 15 degrees Scorpio. But um, it is, I, I think, very humorous that these, these astrologers would go um, away for that month. Um, like I said, particularly fishing, it's when that time of year when it was uh, the best time for, for that, which was a very popular pastime. So, you know, I think in some respect, it was the astrologers being a little shady and saying, hey, you know, we need a break, but we don't want to tell people we don't want to work. So let's take this part of the heavens that is not necessarily the greatest, particularly with its series of fixed stars, which would be a whole other uh, lecture. And let's just not answer questions during this time. Um, and so they have it. That isn't necessarily confirmed. That is something that astrologers, research astrologers have theorized why um, that has happened. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I've looked at many charts where um, the ruler has fallen into this uh, 30 degree span of the zodiac and it has not made one bit of difference, um, the ability to read the chart or the reading itself. So um, <clears throat> with that, let's move on. <clears throat> so timing the question. This is another thing that a lot of astrologers will debate and I would be more than happy to debate this with anybody who wants to, to have this discussion. That's the great thing about astrology is that there's a lot of different ways to do it. I can only share with you what I have learned from my instructor at AIR's uh, research. So timing of the question. Some, you will hear some authors that have, have written and said, you know, you, uh, when the person asks the question, so that is, you know, when you should cast the chart, essentially, because we have to make sure we're casting at the right time. So if somebody sends me a message and says, hey, I've got a horary question for you. Where is my wallet? And they send it to me at two o'clock in the morning, but I don't get to it till 730 in the morning. Um, do I cast the chart when I understand the question or do I cast the chart when the person asks the question? And what seems to work time and time and time and time again is when the astrologer understands the question um, and the location of the astrologer, as opposed to the location and the time that the person asked the question. Uh, a long time ago when people would write letters, um, you know, the, to, to ask query questions by mail to astrologers, uh, some would, you know, put the date and time that they, you know, wrote the question down for the astrologer. Um, <clears throat> but it really should be instead of the, the person where the astrologer is and the, the time the astrologer answers the question, which checks out in medieval methods. People were not sending horary questions via distance. They were certainly weren't calling astrologers over the phone. They were in, the, in their, the chambers, the offices of the astrologer. So the astrologer was understanding the question um, at, at the location that the person just happened to be um, asking it as well. This also, allows the astrologer to double check and make sure they understand what the question is, which is incredibly important. Um, if the astrologer doesn't necessarily understand the question, um, they may come up with a wrong answer, which is why it's incredibly important, at least for me when I receive horary questions, to check in with, with them and make sure that I understand everything. So just as an example, if somebody says, you know, um, <clears throat> Will, um, you know, my um, grandmother, uh, should my grandmother um, have this surgery or should this gra my grandmother, you know, be moved into this retirement home or this retirement home? Well, you know, I need to know um, 
who's, is it your paternal mother, your or paternal grandmother, your maternal grandmother? Um, also important now, you know, are you adopted? Is it, are you even biologically related to them? Because that can change the house. It's really important to understand where the client is coming from and, and what the question is. If we talk about the one like, you know, how is my meeting going to go with my boss? You know, I might look at, okay, a meeting that I'm having with my boss. Let's look at the third house that, that's meetings. But by probing and asking like, okay, well, what's going on with this meeting? You know, what? You know, well, I'm, I'm concerned about what my boss is going to tell me, da 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 So what you really want to know is what is on your boss's mind? Well, then that's going to be uh, the 12th house because that'll be the mind of the boss and we'll talk about derived houses later. So it's really important um, <clears throat> that the question is timed when the astrologer understands it, okay? Otherwise, you're going to get um, a dirty answer. Okay. All right, so some... Um, Keys to success that I have, have learned that make um, horary um, more successful, more accurate, and I think are just uh, wonderful things to, to make sure that you have if you're ever going to learn horary or use horary. Um, and first, like we were just talking about, is understand the question, right? But not just understanding the question. Make sure that you're answering only the question. If somebody is asking you, you know, um, you know, is um, my is my uh, my my daughter's being bullied at school? Um, you know, should I talk to the principal? You know, if you start to see other things in the chart, don't start moving around like we would in a natal chart from this house to this house and pull up information like, okay, well, where is this coming from and where is that coming from with this person? Stick to the question at hand. They have asked one thing and that's what the chart will show the second you start trying to include other planets in the chart and it may look you know like oh you know the the ruler is is opposed by this sign and that or by this planet and normally in, in traditional natal astrology or, or transits and progressions that's kind of a big deal but if that planet isn't a key player in the question um which we'll take a look at what that means it's you, ignore it. You may kind of put it in the back of your head as kind of like some information for you, but answer only the question that is asked, okay? Next thing is to find the correct house. And this is where a lot, I remember when I was learning, it must have spent <laughs> six or seven months practicing with chart after chart after chart of finding the correct house, you know, um, because the second you are not using the right house, you're going to get the wrong answer. So making sure that you are using the correct house for the question. And then finally, this one is, is something that is probably controversial with traditional horary astrologers, is um, the aspects. So if you're looking for an aspect between two planets, the person asking the question, and then you know the quesited, which is what is being asked about, and there's <clears throat> an aspect between the two of them, but it's a separating aspect, it doesn't matter. That's in the past. Essentially think of it as the aspect does not exist. We only look at applying aspects in horror. Now, separating aspects, we can get some information about the past with the situation, but it's really not useful information. Um, so you really only wanna focus on applying aspects and you wanna give yourself also very wide orbs, which we'll see in the examples here shortly. Um, so if you have, I mean, you can go as far as an entire sign um, in terms of an aspect if it's applying. So if you have something at one degree Aries and 22 degrees Sagittarius, those planets are still trining one another, even though it's, you know, 140, like it's, it's huge orb. It's really about, um, sign aspects and applying okay and we can debate that too if you <laughs> if you want at some point so all right so let's talk about finding the right house and this is just some information that i want to want to give you because we've got these 12 areas of life to work with and let me get my little uh, fun pointer here so for many of us you know i'm not going to break down every single house you know that is in here but 
derived houses is a technique of horary where we turn the wheel um, or we talk about houses of houses, which some of us, you know, may be familiar with um, in natal astrology, you know, for example, if the first house is us and the seventh house is our partners um, and our second house is money, so this is the second house from the seventh, this becomes our partner's money. And we can do this round and round and round and round and round. So if you had, um, you know, 10th house is the boss, like I said earlier, you know, we wanted to know what is on your boss's mind, we would go boss and then the mind, which is ruled by the third, is the third from the tenth. So that's one, two, three. So now the twelfth house becomes what's on your boss's mind. Um, also what's on your mother's mind. Um, you know, with, with this method, the fourth is going to represent the father, the tenth is going to represent the mother, um, as opposed to some of the more modern fourth is is mother, it's moon, and tenth is is Saturn, it's father. Um, but our, our lineage, our roots comes from our father's line. We still, you know, take uh, the name of our, our father at birth, et cetera. And it just statistically, it just works out better um, more often, um, almost at 100% accuracy when you switch them, at least in horary. In your personal practice, you may want to, you know, if you're doing natal, like who is the more, you know, dominant parent or, you know, et cetera, so on and so forth. But in horary, um, we, we stick to that. Um, and you can count out as, as many as you want. So let's say that you're, we're talking about, you know, your friend's boyfriend's pet, okay? So somebody asks about their friend's boyfriend. So first we find the house of the uh, friend, which would be the 11th, and their boyfriend. Now here's, here's, here, here's the rub. Um, <clears throat> if it's a partner that you're living with, okay, and you're sharing, you know, bills and responsibilities, that's seventh. But if you're still dating and you've not, don't have that kind of living together commitment, whether you're married or not, that will always fall into the fifth. So we're going to say that our friend or her boyfriend, they don't live together. So then we have to find our friend's boyfriend, which would be the fifth from the 11th. So that would be one, two, three, four, five. So the third house is now my friend's boyfriend and it's our friend's boyfriend's pet. <laughs> so we have to count six from him because it's his pet, not my, not our pet, which would be sixth, not their pet, which um, would be uh, uh, fifth, or sorry, fourth. Um, we count six from there. So then we go one, two, three, four, five, six. So now the eighth house, which we traditionally, you know, think of as the house of, you know, things that are, are, are hidden, our shadow selves, you know, that is death, sex, and taxes, stuff that we, you know, we uh, hear about a lot, now takes the place of, and if you wanted to write it down, it would be also be the house of a friend's um, boyfriend or girlfriend's pet, but also a friend's boyfriend or girlfriend's health as well would also fall in there. So you can see this can, it can, it can get a little confusing. It can also be a lot of fun. Um, spinning the house and, you know, we could certainly spend hours and hours and hours going through some examples, but, you know, you want to think about, um, you know, what's being asked and what rules it, which is why finding the right house is incredibly important because if the client came to me and said, you know, I'm asking about, you know, my friend's boyfriend's, you know, pet, you know, they're really sick, you know, what should we do? Um, and I look at the sixth house um, because it's a house of pets it's not the correct pet we're looking at. This would be the, you know, um, it would be this person's pet. And if they asked about this person's, um, this, the girlfriend's, boyfriend's pet's health, now that we found the pet itself, you know, we assess the, the house for the physical body of the pet. But to get to the pet's health, it would be the sixth house from the pet. So we would continue counting and go one, two, three, four, five, six. And we come back to the first. Um, so let's um, um, let's look at some examples. But first, does anybody have any questions, uh, comments, concerns, etc.? While I, I I pull up these charts for us. No. Okay. All right, so let's um, go ahead and uh, get into some of 
uh, these example charts. So here was a, um, a, a friend of mine came to me with this one, um, needed to buy new glasses. So they wanted to know like, you know, I've looked at two pairs of glasses. Should I buy this pair or should I buy that pair? You know, I'm cheap, so I probably would have just naturally gone with the cheap glasses, but he, they wanted to know, so I'm, we're going to assess it. So first we have to look at the ascendant um, to, for the person that is asking the question, and that is Scorpio. And Scorpio um, is ruled by Pluto, okay? So in Pluto, because we're using modern rulers, because we're using the uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And then we need to consider, um, you know, uh, the glasses, you know, this pair or that pair. Now, the first question I need to ask them is, which glasses did you physically look at first? Now, they said the expensive or the cheap, so I assume that we're looking at the expensive first, because this is important, because we're deciding between two different things that are going to be ruled by the same house, and that can get uh, a little muddy. So, um, he said, you know, he looked at the expensive pair first and then the cheap ones. Well, okay, anything that we own, movable objects, is going to fall into the second house, okay? So here we have uh, Sagittarius on the cusp of the, the second, which makes Jupiter the ruler of the first pair of glasses, okay? Now, obviously the second pair of glasses we can't have also being ruled by Jupiter. We wouldn't be able to compare them. So we have to go to the second house of the second house. So this would be uh, one and then two. So the first pair of glasses are ruled by Jupiter. The second pair of glasses are ruled by Capricorn and the uh, current is ruled by Scorpio. And look at this, this is really beautiful. We've got Jupiter and Saturn and Pluto all down here in the third house, which is our, our communication, you know, our, our vision. Um, which is going to be naturally ruled by glasses anyway, which I think is fascinating. And that's what makes this chart radical. And there are certain signatures that you can see to uh, see if the chart is, is good or not. This lines up pretty well. Um, so, you know, this really feels like the chart works and it certainly did. So now we need to assess, um, is there any good aspects between applying, should we say, uh, between the uh, person um, and the two um, sets of glasses. So we have Jupiter, um, which is um, at 26 Pluto, but it's retrograde, so it's already passed and Pluto's there. So they are not conjunct um, and they're not necessarily, a, well, they are applying to a conjunction because it's retrograde, but we'll get to that in a second. But it's passed. If Jupiter was direct, there would be no aspect. You wouldn't consider them conjunct because they are already um, away from one another. Then we have Saturn, okay? And Saturn rules the cheap pair of glasses, okay? Um, and we've got, this is interesting too, because Jupiter is the planet of, you know, um, excess and, you know, luxury and wealth and good fortune very, very much uh, feels to be tied to, um, you know, um, an expense, a more expensive pair of glasses, you know, and certainly more money because it's in Capricorn. Then we have the cheaper uh, pair of glasses, which are Saturn, which is in Aquarius in rulership. This is nice, um, but not really necessarily, um, you know, something that we uh, need to really uh, kind of consider. Um, in this in this particular chart. So <clears throat> do either of these uh, planets make applying aspects to these um, to, to the ruler of the chart, which is uh, Pluto, or the, the person here? Um, the answer is is yes, this is out of sign it's a it's a half a it's a one sign and we only use the ptolemaic aspects so the sextile through the opposition um in conjunction obviously um for for aspects so that would be a technically kind of like a semi sextile you know one sign away but jupiter is retrograde it is physically moving towards the current towards this person and it will get there before saturn does and saturn would have to change signs Right, and Saturn is, is you know, it's it's an Aquarius who can see, you know, um, why 
these glasses, one pair of glasses may be better for for them than the other. You know, the more expensive pair of glasses is sharing a sign and element, obviously, um, with the the quarant. So it's you know it, it jives a little bit better um, than let's say this Saturn Aquarius type glasses, which may be very practical <laughs> to get the um, you know the the cheaper pair of glasses and but they may be unconventional and that may you know they may not be a style that this um, individual wants so you know my advice was um, logically if you have to save money obviously go with the cheaper glasses if you can afford it you're going to be happier um, with the with the more um, expensive in terms of which I mean most of us you know I, I probably feel that way um, about stuff. I don't necessarily think just because something is more expensive, it necessarily makes it better or, um, or that I may even like it, you know, in terms of buying glasses, I buy glasses, um, you know, when I have to replace them and um, more expensive isn't necessarily always better for me. But in this situation, it was, um, you know, and the, this um, uh, friend of mine did uh, purchase them, was very happy. Um, and this fortune of Jupiter, interestingly enough, um, they got a really great deal on them because they had a sale when, when they finally went in to go purchase them. So they got them at the discounted price, which I think is interesting. We've got this kind of retrograde energy here as well, kind of telling us a little bit more about that story. So, all righty. So let's move on to um, a more complex one. And this one you may have seen on my website. Um, you know, if you go to my website, I've got some examples of horary, these kind of adventures in horary that I share. Um, this is one of them. And you know, this one I, I just, I really like. It's, it's a whole lot of fun. Um, and I have permission. So I don't like to share charts unless I have permission to use them. So here was a, a friend of mine called me um, very late at night. <laughs> um, from their roommate's phone because they could not find their phone in a total panic because in today's day and age, you know, we um, are very connected to our, our phones. So, um, you know, asked me, you know, if I could find it with, with horary. So I said, sure, you know, let's, let's give it a try. And I sat down and we took a look and, you know, let's, let's do that together now. So the, um, person asking the question is Pisces. So it's ruled by, by Neptune, you know, in this first house, um, you know, Neptune is the ruler, but also Mars is also the ruler of this person because it shares a house. This is called a co-ruler. And the first house can show us, not that this is ever really that important for giving an answer to someone, but the first house does show us uh, the disposition of the person asking the question. So you know, confused and uh, with this Neptune kind of energy, um, Mars is certainly, you know, pacing, racing, you know, where's my phone? I got to find it. You know, I can't see it. I can't, you know, this kind of very, speaks very much to this kind of Neptune, um, Mars energy here, which I, I thought was really beautiful. So let's take a look at um, finding the phone. And this is uh, something that I think is, is really great use of horary, finding missing objects. So just like the glasses were the second house, the phone, I know some people would say, oh, a phone is the third house, but it is a movable object that we own. So it is the second, okay? So we find the ruler of the phone, which is Venus, but also by extension Uranus because it's in there. And this is pretty fascinating. We've got Venus in Gemini in the third house, right? Uh, that rules the phone and all very phone type communication, you know, um, you know, those types of just what a phone rules, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so before we look at where the phone is, let's see if the phone will come back because that's kind of important, um, you know, and that's you, we see um, assess whether or not um, there is a good aspect between um, the ruler um, of the, the ruler of the current, the person asking, and then the ruler of the phone. So um, we've got um, Venus here, we've got Neptune and Mars. So um, we have this 
um, Venus is making a very wide, see this is seven degrees, this is 20 degrees, which normally would not count as a sextile, but we are going by an entire whole sign, so this gives us a yes, at least one, but we've got multiple planets, so let's, let's take a look and see. So this is a weak yes, it's a wide, wide sextile. The Mars um, um, is the next planet that rules um, the individual, and we've got um, Venus here rules the phone. Now Venus is faster um, than Mars, so and Venus is already past that four degree. So while the chart shows a sextile because it's, you know, the way the, the software calculates it, this Venus is already past the sextile with Mars, and that shows a no. So we've got one yes and one no. Um, you know, how do we decide which one it is, right? Well, we can actually come to the moon. Um, the moon can be, fun fact, can be exchanged for any other planet, um, or for any, any planet that rules the quarant or the quesited, which is what it's being asked about. So if we pretend we swap the moon for Neptune, right, and we see is there an aspect between Neptune and Venus? No. Uh, if we swap the moon for Mars, is there an aspect between the moon um, and Venus again? Obviously no. Um, or is there an aspect between the moon? If we make the moon the phone, um, we can look at it as um, an aspect to Neptune or Mars. Now the moon is fast, it's at 26 degrees. Um, it's already um, past that sextile. So that is also a no. Right, um, but we did have a yes. So you know, this I made me feel like the phone could be found, but I questioned its integrity. I'm like, uh, if it comes back, it's not going to be in one piece, or you know, it, you know, I, I was like, the, the phone's not going to come back the same. Maybe it's going to have a crack in it or a scratch in it or something like that. You know, just there's going to be something different about it because I, you know, the it just, we had a yes in there, so there had to be some positive outlook and aspect to it. Um, I did double check. You can see if a an item has been stolen. And I did, I do always uh, check that with, with a missing object. Um, we, we see that with the seventh house. Um, if one of the rule, if the ruler of the missing object is in the seventh house, um, you know, then, then we would see that it is with um, an enemy. Um, could also, um, if it's in the 12th at times, sometimes it can be an enemy as well. But uh, we're not seeing any seven or 12 um, connections here, you know, other than Venus being in there, but we're not going to go any further than the planets involved, remember, you know, like I said earlier. So um, we can see that the, um, that there's a chance it's there's there's a, a fair to decent chance it's going to come back probably not and with complete integrity or maybe the case is going to be missing you know who knows um so i then took a look at you know we look at direction so venus rules um the the phone so it's and it's in the third house which is south by southeast okay so we can see very clearly that where my friend was when uh, he asked me about the phone um, stand. He was in his apartment, so you know, stand in the in the middle of your apartment, um, you know, and face south, southeast. Look in that area. Go to um, that corner of, of that area of your home, that corner of that room that you're in, etc. We can also look at the um, not. Uh, we also look at the. Um, disposition of the, the second house, which rules objects, um, which is going to describe the location that it's in. And we've got Taurus on the cusp here. So I was like, okay, so Taurus um, is an earth sign. So it's someplace low, it's someplace um, dark, possibly someplace hidden. And we've also got this Venus um, in, in Gemini. We had Gemini in there and I'm like, there's something low. Is it under, is it under a window, you know, is it, you know, under your car because we've got this transportation aspect here. And then I thought, you know, Taurus also traditionally rules uh, barns and sheds. 
and I said, um, I said, Stan, I was on the phone and I said, Stan in your apartment, I said, face south, um, you know, by southeast. I said, are you facing your garage? Um, he said, yeah, in that general kind of area. Yeah, I said, I, I said, I think you've lost it, you know, while you were traveling. I said, if you, you know, if it's not sitting in a parking lot somewhere, um, which I didn't think it was because there was a chance of getting it back. I said, I think that it's in the garage or possibly in the car and it's very Aries, <laughs> Mars kind of energy. I already looked, you know, got very animated. I said, will you just humor me um, and look again? I'm like, move, you know, look, look under. I'm like, you were kind of worked up. I said, just take a couple breaths. Let's, let's go. Go ahead and take a look again. I said, because we're getting these, is, these are the signatures that are in the chart. So went on uh, down to <laughs> his car. He's looking in the garage. He's looking under the car. Nothing. He's, you know, he's like, I'm looking under the seat. And I'm like, are you really looking under the seat? I said, move the seat. See, you know, what happens. So he's, hits the thing, moves the seat. And I hear um, an expletive um, with a crunch. And in the process of moving the seat, the, the phone was wedged um, under the seat, but when um, I slid it um, up on the, the track that the seat was in, um, it cracked the phone's screen. Um, so he has all, he's um, had all like just demolished the screen. It was horrible looking. Um, which is interesting because, you know, it's, it's coming back, but not coming back and not kind of intact. And, um, but it really was, it was low, it was dark. It was, you know, in this kind of shed garage placement tied to travel, um, must have fallen out of his pocket when he was getting out of the car and down along the side of the, the car and under the seat, said he had looked there, made him look again, um, but um, found, you know. So here is um, an example of how I know we can utilize horary to find missing objects. Um, fun fact, while we're on this, while I pull up the, the next one, um, is when you're looking for a missing person, okay, uh, it's very popular and for a lot of like psychics and mediums and astrologers, you know, working on missing pieces and persons. Um, the research that, that Alfie has done shows that you're going to get an, an answer to the location of the missing individual or child or, or whatever um, when you have the correct chart. Now, when is the correct chart? When the person asks the astrologer, and it turns out that the correct chart for a missing person is when the 911 call was placed. Um, and that would be um, because that's that moment of extreme passion where um, they're asking for help in finding someone. So you have to, it's, it's, it's hard unless you're close to the person to say, you know, when did you call 911? But that is the chart that you need is, is the time and location of the 911 call to locate a missing individual. Um, so, uh, so yes. <clears throat> So let's uh, look at this final one in our last 10 minutes we have here. And this is, is my boyfriend married? All right. So this was, um, you know, a client of mine that had, and, and I, I assure you, I have permission to use this chart um, that was, was dating someone, but began to begin a little suspicious um, about whether or not, you know, their they first thought their boyfriend was seeing someone else. Um, and then just, I guess, or thought maybe she wasn't interested and she came and she said, is, is this guy that I'm seeing married? All right, let's, let's take a look. So we follow the same rules and um, here we have to count some houses. So we look first at the ascendant, which is ruled by um, the person that's asking the question. And um, we also, we, we have two, we have Uranus because it is Aquarius on the cusp of the ascendant and Neptune, which is um, here in the first house. Now here, You'll notice Neptune is intercepted, which means that Pisces is in completely in this first house and flanked by two other signs. This, um, if that's a missing object, if the missing object is in an intercepted house, it's going to take forever to find it. Uh, just a side note there. When you have the quarant in an intercepted house, they're feeling lost and confused. And um, with the Neptune energy there, uh, um, obviously um, emotional. Um, maybe feeling a bit uh, diluted. And then we have the, 
the quarant themselves um, by Uranus. And we'll look at Uranus first because it is the, the cusp of the house. Now we have to look at the boyfriend. So the boyfriend um, is going to be the fifth house from her. So that really is the fifth house and that we have uh, Gemini on the cusp, which makes Mercury the ruler of, of the boyfriend. And here we have this applying opposition to one of the rulers. We have a separating trine here. So this doesn't really, there's no aspect here with this Mercury. So, you know, that, you know, makes me feel like, oh, uh, there's this kind of separation between the two, but there's also this opposition, which oppositions are two people facing one another, two planets opposing, which feels a bit confrontational. So I'm like, oh, this is going to end in a confrontation, um, either uh, however it, you know, pans out. But again, not what the client asked. We don't need to share that information with them. I'm just sharing that with you to show how the, the, the chart can tell a story. So we have to look at if there is a relationship between the boyfriend, which is the fifth, and what would be his spouse if he has one. Um, and that would be the seventh from the... Um, seventh from the 11th house okay so or sorry seventh from seventh from the fifth which is the 11th because we count one two three four five six seven and we have sagittarius here so jupiter is going to be ruled by um a a wife um or a husband you know where it's in 20 we're in 2021 is he married spouse so, um, and here we have um, this uh, Jupiter at uh, 17 Capricorn. We've got the moon about to make a conjunction with it. Um, we also have the ruler of the boyfriend, 1640. And we've got this 1746 um, is at a very close, very tight applying trine, you know? Um, which is a, a harmonious aspect between the two. And this really kind of screams this person is probably married, um, you know, whether they're still together or not, and he's sneaking around, you know, they may be separated, but the question is, is he married? And the answer to that question here clearly is yes. And if we swap out the moon for the other rulers, like we did, we've got this applying conjunction to Neptune there. We also are applying conjunction to Jupiter, excuse me, you know, if we change Mercury out for it, but we can also change Jupiter out for it. Um, and we've got 1607 and 1640. The moon is not only making a applying conjunction to Jupiter, but it's making an applying trine to Mercury, you know, and I, that, you know, we've got the ruler of the, the, um, the woman who, who asked um, in this kind of opposition with, with, the, with the boyfriend and in this separating trine, this kind of sudden shocking kind of energy here. Um, you know, and like in any type of counseling, you know, we have to be very delicate how we present information to others, but you know, we tell the truth um, nonetheless. So, you know, met with, with, with uh, this person you know, over the phone, discussed what was going on um, and heard back from them uh, a week later that the, um, the, the person she was seeing was indeed married, um, they were separated. I was not completely convinced of that <laughs> because um, of these really tight trines um, and, and conjunctions. Um, you know, I didn't say anything, but I got a phone call a week after that later um, saying that, um, you know, he's gonna work things out um, with his wife. Um, you know, and I, you know, with this, this, this Neptune here, this chaotic Uranus, you know, my, she really was probably better off without him, but that was not the question that was asked, you know, um, I want to make sure we stay true to the questions. So, um, with that, um, those are the three, um, examples that I, I have. I know I only have an hour with you, um, this evening and I try and, uh, stay within, those things. I've missed some chats here. Um, uh, so Linda says, what orbs do you use for aspects? I think I've at, I think I, I answered that Linda, the, the, um, the orb is an entire sign essentially. Um, if it's applying, 
of course. Um, in horary, in horary only, you know, I'm much more conservative in, in natal um, work, but the, um, but with horary, you think of it as, as something that is living and, and breathing. So here we've got the sun at six degrees. Um, this is a 20 degree difference in, in a trine here, right? Um, the chart wouldn't even necessarily show it, and I, I really don't think it does. If we go to the grid, sun to Saturn, it doesn't even list it as one. But because this sun will, in the fullness of time, in its movement through Virgo, make a trine, we consider this an applying aspect between the sun and Saturn. Now, we wouldn't in this chart anyway, but because um, we wouldn't use those planets, but... Um, you know, just as an example. Um, does anybody else have any other questions um, about anything we've uh, gone over? We've got some more. Uh, okay, so what happens when you get a question wrong? And that, you know, that's certainly, we are not um, infallible. And the first thing, you know, I, I always um, make uh, sure is very important to share is, is that, you know, um, blame the astrologer, blame me, don't blame the astrology. You know, the astrology is always right. It's us as astrologers that can get stuff wrong. Just like when we get stuff right, we need to make sure we're making astrology the star of the show because um, it's not about us, it's about the stars. But when we do get questions wrong, and it does happen, you know, none of us are infallible, just like lawyers don't make mistakes and doctors and astrologers, even with our own, you know, natal analyses, you know, we can make mistakes. Um, I think that it's important to, um, you know, own them, you know, and, and learn from them. I know when I have made mistakes with clients, um, I have offered to redo horaries for them. Um, I have a very liberal, um, you know, money back, policy um, in terms of horary because I want, you know, I want to own my own mistakes, um, you know, and I, and I want people to, you know, get, get their, get their money's worth. Um, and I don't think I've ever been taken advantage of for that. I don't think anybody's ever like had a good horary. It's come out true. And they said it didn't just to get their money back, you know. Um, but I think when we get something wrong, it's important to not only own it, but to go back and look and find out what we got wrong um, so that we don't make that mistake again. Um, th there's no way to be 100% accurate 100% of the time. We're human, we, we, we make mistakes, but learning from them I think is so incredibly important um, because we may have missed something. If we got something wrong and we're like, oh, you know, I should have noticed that, maybe we'll be more vigilant next time. Or if we are uncovering something else in the chart that would have meant or would have um, sent that notion to signal that something else is the correct answer, um, we can learn from that as well and kind of add that to our toolbox to um, improve this sacred science. So, and then um, Aaron has said, random thought tidbit, Vedic astrology uses full sign aspects to all charts. That's fascinating, Aaron. I've never studied Vedic um, astrology other than um, I know the terms um, K2 and, and, and Rahu, um, etc. cetera. So, um, fun. Any other questions, comments, concerns? No? Well, if not, um, you're very welcome, Letty. It was wonderful being able to present this to you guys. I hope you uh, learned a, a little bit about, um, you know, what I do in my my world here, and hopefully some of you will be inspired to <coughs> learn more about horary uh, somewhere else. Um, you're very welcome, Stephanie. Um, again, there's some really great horary programs out there. So, um, with that being said, I, I uh, you know, Linda, unless you have anything else that you, you need or, or, or want to add for the good of the group. Okay, well, that's it. I just want to say thank you so much for a fascinating meeting. 
Looking yeah, forward to having you again. Would mm -hmm. please thank Eric Pride, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, you have a great, everyone have a great night. Enjoy the rest of your week and um, happy fall.